All right, I completely took apart my studio just to make this video because it needs to be taught. Today, I'm gonna take you through all the steps to set up your multi-clock to work with Ableton Live. And it's basically the same in Logic with one main difference, which I'll cover. And it's pretty much similar across all other DAWs. And I'll also try my best to explain the annoyances of the multi-clock and why they're there. But first, let's cover who should not buy a multi-clock. If you're thinking about buying a multi-clock just to send some MIDI notes from your DAW to a synthesizer, save your money and do not buy one. Just use the USB cable your synth came with and a powered USB hub. I have a link to the powered hub that I've been using down below. It's been working great with my USB-C only MacBook Air. And on top of that, the multi-clock excels in a lot of things, but its main reason for existence is to sync multiple things at once very accurately. So if you have a few drum machines or rhythmic devices that need to be on the exact same beat down to the millisecond, then the multi-clock is for you. I repeat, if you have a MIDI track in your DAW with a chord progression and you want your chord progression to be played on your mini freak or whatever it is, do not buy a multi-clock. Okay, with that out of the way, let's get this thing set up. So. The most difficult thing about the multi-clock is getting a spare audio output from your audio interface into your multi-clock. You cannot do this with audio interfaces that only have a left and right or one and two output. You need an interface that has additional outputs. Four is pretty much the minimum. You could do it with three outputs, but I don't know any interfaces that have that odd number. And yes, the multi-clock can receive transport information and MIDI clock over USB, but that is not why you buy a multi-clock. You want the main selling point of this, which is sample accurate MIDI sync. And you get this by using the audio sync input. The multi-clock is looking for an audio signal that's generated from the free plugin you download for the multi-clock, the multi-clock plugin. And I've linked to that down below as well in case you can't find it. And that's what we need to set up with these extra outputs. So let's take a look at that now. So get your DAW of choice open. In this case, I'll be using Live 12, but it works basically the same on Live 10, 11. Honestly, any version of Ableton Live should be fairly similar. And even in Logic, it's pretty similar, except for that one annoying thing that took me way too long to figure out, but I'll explain it when we get there so you don't have to figure out and take as long as I did. Now that we have our blank canvas open here, we're gonna go ahead and load the multi-clock plugin into an empty track. Then let's set this specific tracks audio output to output three of our audio interface. So we're gonna go to this track here, choose external output, and then in this drop-down menu, you can see that three and four is not here. So what we're gonna do is go to configure. You can see that our Fireface UCX or whatever audio interface you're using will be here. Then you go to output configure and select three and four. This is different from three slash four because this is two separate mono outputs. And while we're here, I might as well name it multi-clock out. And we'll hit okay and then close this. And now when I select this again, you can see our multi-clock output channel three is right here. Next up, make sure you have a cable from your audio interface output number three going to the multi-clock audio input. Now, I'm gonna say this just because I should, right? This is very different from your audio input number three. Make sure you're using audio output number three when plugging into your audio interface. We're sending audio from our DAW to the multi-clock. And another note here is to make sure that you have your audio interface internal routings properly set up. So for me on my RME UCX Mark II in Total Mix, I'm gonna make sure that I have my outputs three, four only listening to the software, AKA DAW outputs three, four. If other sounds are also being output of that channel from your DAW, you're, and that's the channel that's connected to your multi-clock, you're gonna have issues. So make sure it's the only sound, that plug-in sound that is being sent to output three. And that's the channel we're gonna be using here. So here I'm gonna select output three, four, and you can see that everything has their volume turned down except for analog output three, four. And I'm gonna set that to max volume. If we go back to our main outputs, I'm gonna turn down software three, four, so we don't hear the crazy sound that the multi-clock plugin makes. And while we're on the topic of auxiliary settings, here are my live settings for audio monitoring and latency that have worked for me. 
I have delay compensation on as well as reduced latency when monitoring. And to be honest, I'm not exactly sure what they do, but so far it's worked for me and the way that I record, which is I usually leave most of my tracks set to in instead of auto, and then I turn them off when I've recorded what I need. Oh, and as far as audio routing goes, this is a really simple setup. I have circuit tracks going into audio inputs one and two, and that on audio one here, I'll call this circuit, and our external input will be internal inputs one, two. So when I make a sound on circuit, you can see that that sound comes in. And now that we're here, I'm gonna go ahead and put a little four on the floor kick drum here on circuit, and we're gonna go ahead and connect MIDI output one of the multi-clock into the MIDI input of circuit. Okay, now let's test to see if our work was done correctly. We'll press record in our DAW and wait for the multi-clock to react. Boom, and it's running. Now, this is where things get annoying because as you can tell, the multi-clock starts one bar late after pressing play. The reason it's doing this is because the multi-clock is still in a mode where you're able to adjust and shift each individual's channel timing offset early or late, AKA negatively or positively. The multi-clock waits one bar because if you wanted to play this machine early, it's gonna need time to react to that, one bar to be exact. You cannot tell the multi-clock, hey, you know, I want this drum machine to play 10 milliseconds early, so it's your job, Mr. Multi-clock, to predict the future of when I'm gonna press play and then start playing 10 milliseconds before I even press spacebar. Does that make sense? And if it doesn't, don't worry, we're gonna change this mode to make it play right when you press play in your DAW. So. The next step is to change those settings on our multi-clock from, we're gonna hit this here, go over to configure, and machine mode, we're gonna go from negative positive to just positive, and then go back to home. So this setting actually eliminates the ability for the multi-clock to play our tracks early, which means that the multi-clock doesn't need that one bar time to react. Now we're gonna press record and bam you can see that it starts right away. But this brings up a new issue. As you can tell, it's way off, right? And we need to move this kick drum early. But the setting we just set on the multi-clock removes that ability to move and adjust our timing early. But this is an easy fix. Check this out. In Ableton Live, what I'm gonna do is click this option here and say track options. This will then bring up this option here, which is my track delay. In Live 11 and prior, it was also called track delay, but accessed by this little button here. And to do this in Logic, look for this setting right here called delay and adjust it by dragging up and down in the empty field next to it. Now, I can take the track that hosts my multi-clock plugin and tell Ableton to play that track early instead. Doing it this way is totally different from having the multi-clock play early because Live or Logic or whatever DAW is the main primary clock in this setup, right? In this situation. So when I press play in my DAW, this multi-clock plugin track will play first by however many milliseconds I choose then play the rest of the arrangement. So the big trick here is to set our plugins track so early that even when everything on the multi-clock is set to zero, our machines are recorded in early compared to the whole arrangement. And we need it set this way because of those settings that we changed on the multi-clock that no longer allow us to adjust our timing early or negatively. We can only adjust our timing positively, pushing it later into the arrangement. I really hope that part makes sense. If not, maybe showing it all in action and adjusting it will help. So check this out. So now I'm gonna set my multi-clock plugins track delay by minus 50 milliseconds. This means that the multi-clock and everything that is plugged into it will be playing 50 milliseconds early. Now, when I hit record and lay down a track, you can see that our simple 4-4 kick pattern is recorded in a bit early. Now, this is where the fun begins. I'll zoom in, highlight this little section, hit Z to jump in and jump in a little more, and I'll select the point where I want my kick to be 
and click and drag over to where my kick actually starts. I'm gonna hold down Command so I can get a bit more granular with it and it doesn't lock to the grid and go right here. Now, if I hover over this, you'll notice right in this section, it'll say how many milliseconds exactly we need to push our kick drum late or push its timing positively to be right here. And you can see down in the bottom, it says 31 milliseconds. Now on the multi-clock, I can go into that specific track, which is track one, which is connected to circuit tracks and adjust it by that exact amount. So to dial in my latency amount, I'm not going to be using this big knob. I'm going to hold down the select menu button and hit track one. I've used the big knob before, which is fine, but the track setting method, which I'm showing you right now, is way more accurate and you can save your presets so you can recall them later. And on top of that, these settings don't accidentally get bumped by this big knob. So now that we're here, I'm gonna go to our offset and shift our range by 31 milliseconds. And pro tip here, if you really want, you can hold down the select menu button and change this by tenths of a millisecond. So in this case, I might just do 31.6, just so I can get way up in there. But hey, as long as you're close enough, you're pretty much good to go. So now that we have this here, I'm gonna go ahead and select this, hit select menu and go back to home. Now let's try it again. We're gonna start back from the beginning, hit record, turn follow off and see where our kick lands. Look at that, we're basically right on the money. If I really zoom in there, this is technically not even a millisecond. It's not registering, but I'm gonna adjust it again. This is all trial and error. You just kind of mess around with this as much as you want. Boom, let's try that one one more time. And I'm always using the second bar here because I find that that's enough time for the machine to react and catch up to the multi-clock and really get a solid sync. So this is looking pretty good to me here. And again, you can be as nitpicky as you want here, but for me, as long as I'm within two milliseconds of where I want my drums to be, I'm fine as long as they are not early. I find that this is enough for me to be able to arrange and copy paste my drums around a lot and not notice that weird click or a beat skipping around. Lastly, another tip is when recording this way, know that your first kick drum will always be off. Look at that, it's way off. And this isn't just your kick drum. It might be whatever happens on the very first part of your sequence on your groove box. But this is normal, and I don't really think that there is a way around this since it has to do with us pressing play, then your multi-clock, receiving the signal to go, then your machine starting to run to catch up to the multi-clock, and then that machine going into your audio interface and being recorded. So the easy fix here, once I'm done recording, I take the first quarter of the second bar and copy paste that onto the first quarter of the first bar, easy. And another tip is you can save these settings for specific machines on the multi-clock. So for example, if we go into track two, I can go and load for example, my Avalon, the Octatrack, Ableton, my MPC 3000, or if I wanted to save this specific track settings, for example, on track one, I can go and save this to a new spot, maybe down on eight, right? And call it, you know, circuit or whatever it might be. And being able to save these specific settings for this machine is great because every machine has different timing and reacts to MIDI sync differently. And on top of that, that 50 millisecond amount that I set earlier doesn't need to be exactly 50 milliseconds. It just needs to be greater than the slowest machine in your setup. On my typical setup, I usually run about 100 milliseconds of early delay or track delay on the multi-clock plug and track. I find that that's given me enough wiggle room for any machine that I bring in here, plug in, and then I can push it right on the money. Okay. I really hope this video made sense and has helped you out. Thumbs up if it did. Thumbs up if you're just here hanging out and you don't even own a multi-clock. You're always welcome, my friend. And uh, yeah, until next week, you already know the drill. Share the love, share the knowledge. Knowledge is power. Peace. This track sucks.